Good evening. Man, you guys sound dead. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Oh, that's a little bit better. Man, I hope everybody is doing awesome tonight. We've heard two great stories, and I tell you what, they're heartwarming. So I got to try to wrap all of this up for you tonight with all of these stories because trauma can happen to anybody. You know, and trauma just doesn't deal with blood. It deals with emotions. It deals with anger. It deals with your personality. I guess would be a good word for it. It deals with all kinds of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be medical. It could be family. You may be going through a divorce. That's trauma. You might lose your children. That's trauma. You might have cancer. That's trauma. You might have uh, legs. You lose your legs. That's trauma. So there's a variety of trauma that each and every one of us could be going through. And what you heard today, tonight was two individuals that was talking about the trauma that they were involved in at an early age. So my question to you before I get started, and only you can answer this question, you and you alone, nobody else can answer this question for you. And the question is, are you ready? And I want you to think about that. Are you really and truly ready? Are you ready for battle? Tonight's thing's battleground. Are you ready for the battle? Because each and every one of us are in the midst of it. As soon as you walk out of these doors, you're going to be involved in some type of battle. I don't know what it's going to be, but you will be involved in some type of battle. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be two weeks from now. It could be 10 years from now but you will eventually end up in a battle, in a battle of your life. And are you ready for that? And that's a challenging question I hope you will be able to answer by the time we end this evening. When I was seven years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. I was born here in North Carolina. My dad served in the military. So I was able to grow up all over the world. And at the age of seven, I was in West Virginia at a great-grandmother's house. And I accepted Jesus Christ with a pastor who was from Mexico. He was playing soccer, and we went out to the field, and we started talking. And that man led me to the Lord that day. But for many, many years, I didn't live for the Lord. You see, growing up as a military brat, we never really went to church. Maybe once in a while, vacation Bible school, or when we went home, most of my family lives in West Virginia or Ohio, we went to one of their churches. But other than that, we really never grew up in church. Of course, my mom, she grew up Church of God. My dad grew up Church of Christ. So there was a spiritual warfare that was going on in the family. Don't understand it to this day. We're supposed to be Christians. We're supposed to get along with everybody. But yet, even as Christians, as one of your speakers, Josh, said, John 10, the enemy comes to seek, kill, and destroy. And that's what he's doing with Christianity today. That's why you have so many different denominations. Because the enemy has crept in. It crept into my family. So I found myself over in Europe doing a teenage life, doing things I shouldn't have been doing. Then finally I came back to the States and at 16 years old, I started my career in EMS. I'll never forget the first call. I was a junior in high school, didn't know where my life was going to go, went and got a CPR card and the first aid card, and I took my first car, call. Two teenagers decided they were going to get high on heroin. They got into their vehicle, and they started driving. And if you've ever been to West Virginia, you know you don't drive fast around the 15-mile-an-hour turn. At over 120 miles an hour, these two teenagers took a 15-mile-an-hour turn. The vehicle went airborne. The driver was trapped in his vehicle when we got there. The passenger was ejected and dead on scene. We flew the gentleman to the trauma center, and he died about 10 days later. But that call changed my life. I knew the direction I wanted to go from that moment on, and that was to go into the emergency medical services. 
So by the time I was 18 years old, I was an EMT, got married at a young age, started a family, started working at one of the local hospitals. I worked at WVU there in Morgantown, West Virginia. While I was there, I saw a team, and it was the flight team, and I started setting a goal. And I wanted to become a flight paramedic one day. That's what I wanted to do. But there was something missing in my life. And at that time, I didn't know what it was, but I could feel that there was something missing. So I went to paramedic school, worked full time at the hospital, and life was great. My wife and I, we started a family and had babies, and all of that was great. Finished paramedic school, went to Marion County EMS, worked there for a while. Then I went down to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, went back to West Virginia. I was a director over a system, and I got tired. I wanted to go somewhere else. I wanted to go fly, and I started applying for flight position jobs. And I applied all across the United States. But I applied for one ground position. And the ground team I applied for was with Mecklenburg County EMS. I received a phone call, came down to Charlotte, went back home, received another phone call, and they offered me a job with Mecklenburg County. And I humbly accepted, moved my family down to Charlotte, North Carolina, where I would start my career here with Mecklenburg County. Back then, we were on 24-hour shifts. Life was great, but little did I know my life was going to change, and it was going to change forever. The woman I was married to decided she didn't love me anymore, and she wanted a divorce. And I'll never forget that because I lost my three older kids, and that was harder losing them than going through the trauma I went through with the 18-wheeler. And instead of turning to God, I'd done like most of us do. I try to handle it on my own. So I started drinking. I would get off work. We went from 24 hours to 12 hour shifts and I was on night shift and I would get off early in the morning and I would stop and buy a 12 pack of beer, go home and drink it and I would start my life over. And that was the routine I got myself into. Then one hot summer night, a young lady, a young blonde came walking into my life. Her name was Susan. Susan was a nursing student who wanted to come and ride because she eventually wanted to become an emergency department, possibly a flight nurse. Well, Susan and I met, and we fell in love. Susan and I got married. And I'll never forget, right before we started dating, and she was asking me questions. And one of the questions she asked me was, Tim, do you go to church? No, I don't go to church, Susan, but I will. Yeah, I was in love. All the guys were saying, yeah, I'd go to church too for a woman, you know. But you know what Susan was doing? She was bringing me back to God. A Proverbs 31 woman. That's what I call my wonderful wife today. So my wife was bringing me back to God slowly. I went from night shift to day shift. And I'll never forget, I had a rough day at Medic. I started off my morning... My morning was 7.45 a.m. to 7.45 p.m., if I remember right. But anyways, I started off that morning with a pediatric arrest. That's pretty tough. Three-month-old baby, dead. I ended my night with another cardiac arrest. She was around 99 years old. And all in between, we had trauma and vehicular accidents. It was just one of those days. And I got in my car after I clocked out. I started to my apartment. Susan and I hadn't been married yet. And I remember going into a convenience store buying a 12-pack of beer. I went, got into my vehicle, and I went to my apartment. I opened up my door, set my beer on the table, went and opened up the first bottle, took a sip, and I looked at it and said to myself, if I need this, this is wrong. And I poured that 12 pack down the sink and I have not touched a bottle since October of 2000. <laughs> you see, I was masking the things I was seeing, what I had went through. I was trying to cover it up with the bottle. And I'm here to tell you that does not work. 
You already heard one speaker tell you it doesn't work, and I'm going to tell you again, it does not work. The only way you can get over these battles in your life is with our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the only way. A little later on, Susan and I got married. We got married in April 2002, and we started our family. We had our first baby girl. Her name is Caitlin. She's going to be 18 years old. Please pray for me. Ooh, 18 years old. And she likes a guy. She's got a boyfriend. I'm glad he's in West Virginia because he's nine hours away. <sighs> Hallelujah. Following her mother's footsteps. But anyways, we started our family. Life was good. Susan, what I had lost with my first wife, Susan was giving it back to me. And we were in church. and I didn't know what was happening, but it was all good. But little did Susan and I know our lives were going to change and it was going to change forever. January 23rd, 2003, we woke up. I was scheduled to work that morning, and Charlotte received six inches of snow and ice. I got up as normal, and my wife went down to pack our, my lunch up, and I remember putting my blue shirt on and the badge and walking downstairs. She was holding our baby girl. And she looked at me and said, Tim, don't go to work. Please, Tim, don't go. I said, but sweetheart, this is my job. This is what I do. She said, no, Tim, I just don't feel comfortable about you going today. Please don't go. And I said, sweetie, this is my job. Nothing is going to happen to me. I promise. You see, in the emergency services, we put an S on our chest. We're supposed to be the superheroes. Nothing will ever happen to us. And we put that in our brain. Well, I kissed her and I kissed my baby girl goodbye. And I went to work. Showed up at medic for about two and a half hours late. I remember going to medic and I had to contact my partner to tell him I was going to be late. Traffic was stopped on I-85. And finally got there about two and a half hours late. And my supervisor put me with a gentleman. His name was Bobby Suarez. And this is a God thing because Bobby had been a paramedic crew chief at medic for over 15 years at the time. I'd been a paramedic around 10 years. So Bobby and I check off our truck, and we head out. We get our first call. It's a minor accident. We take the patient to the hospital. We leave, and we get stationed up at Lake Norman. Bobby and I was excited because usually when you go to Lake Norman Station, you didn't do anything back then. So we stop, and we get our lunch, and Bobby goes into the station, turns the TV on. He starts eating that nice, juicy Wendy's hamburger like EMS does, our diet was wonderful. And next thing we know, beep, 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 beep. Motor vehicle accident on I-77. Bobby's driving. As we're responding, we see two vehicles in the emergency lane, a Jeep Cherokee and a Mercedes SUV with two females walking around. We have to go up to the next exit to get turned around, which we did. We turned and parked about 20, 25 feet away from the, the initial accident. I go up to one of my patients. She had a small laceration on her nose, and she looked at me and said, well, what are you doing here? Well, I said, ma'am, you called 911. She said, I know, but we just wanted the police. We just needed highway patrol. I said, well, sorry, ma'am. They sent us. Highway patrol's coming. We canceled the North Mech Rescue who was responding with us. And I have my patient step over the guardrail. She said, I don't want to go to the hospital. I said, okay, let me get some paperwork. And literally one second means life or death. One second. In one second, each and every one of us could be gone. I was about ready to walk around this Jeep. If you could picture this in your mind, the Jeep was right up against the guardrail, and I was standing between the guardrail and the Jeep, and I was about ready to walk around this Jeep, and I was going to go on the interstate side. I started out, and the girl leaned over the guardrail and said something to me. I don't know what she said, but it made me go back to her, and as she was leaning over, that's when I heard my partner, Bobby, yell out, Tim, look out, her truck's being hit. And it gave me enough time to turn around and hold out my arm, and I was struck by a fully loaded 18-wheeler, my medic truck, a Mercedes SUV, and the Jeep Cherokee. I was then drugged 64 feet down the guardrail. My partner explained it in the hospital. He said, Tim, you look like a rag doll going down the guardrail, 
and the bed of the truck was jackknifing, and he don't know what happened, but something hit that trailer, and it went back around, and it hit the upper part of my body, and that's when my body and my legs separated from each other. And I flew another 25 feet or so over the guardrail. I never lost consciousness. I could tell you everything that happened except for that short ride down the guardrail. After I was hit, I landed on my back and I sat up and I was trying to crawl back to my truck. I saw that both legs were gone. My right leg was amputated just below the knee, but my left leg looked like I stepped on a landmine. That femur bone was sticking straight up in the air and I could actually see my own pelvis. Then the media was all, the media got a hold of this and what they didn't understand was I had part of the guardrail go through the left side of my chest. I got a scar from here to here where I was flayed open like a fish. And the only problem I was having was I could not breathe. But as I was trying to crawl back to my truck because I didn't know if there were any other injuries, my partner comes up. Tim, Tim, don't move. Don't move, Tim. And I looked at Bobby and said, Bobby, anybody else hurt? Bobby looked down and said, no, Tim, you're the only one. And I knew as a paramedic I was probably going to die. And I looked at Bobby and said, Bobby, call my wife. Call Susan and let her know what's going on. And as I laid there in the snow, the volunteers started showing up. They started working on me. They put me in another ambulance. And I looked up in the clouds and I said, God. You have my faith, God. My faith is yours. And God, if I die, I want to go to heaven and be with you. But if I live, I want to live for you for the rest of my days. And when they put me in that ambulance, Bobby comes. I remember Bobby opening up the doors and he said, Tim, here's the situation. The nearest medic unit's 20 minutes away or so. The helicopter can't fly. They'll fly up to Lake Norman, meet us later. We can't go to Carolina's Medical Center. It's going to take us an hour to get there, but Lake Norman's five minutes away. What do you want to do, Tim? I took a deep breath and said, Bobby, you know what we need to do. We need to go to the hospital, man. Because here in Mecklenburg County, we're not allowed to transport a trauma of my caliber down to any hospital. We have to go to Carolina's automatically. But we couldn't do that that day. Luckily, two paramedics stopped to render assistance. They were from Idaho County. They transported me along with North Mech Rescue and Bobby up to Lake Norman Regional. Helicopter met us there. And again, this is how our God works in our lives. The trauma surgeons were in the hospital that day. They were getting their trauma status, level three trauma status. So they had to be present. That's a God thing. So the trauma surgeons, they came down, they started tying up bleeders. They put me in a medical induced coma. They put a chest tube in, blah, 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 blah. Then I was flown down to Carolina's Medical Center. And I want you to think about a wife, a wife that was sitting at home with a small baby. You see, the Bible says if you have the faith of a mustard seed, he will answer our prayers. And I believe that's what happened that day. My wife was sitting at home watching the breaking news. And guys, you're not going to understand this, but every woman in this room will, I promise you. As my wife was sitting, holding our child, watching the breaking news, she was talking to a friend. And over that phone, her friend was actually a paramedic I used to work with. His old next tell went off. And my wife heard these words. Something's happened to Tim Hayes. He's been hit by a truck. And my wife said she immediately hung up the phone, contacted our dispatch, and told them who she was. Corinne, our supervisor, said, yeah, something's happened, Susan, but somebody's coming to get you. And he's going to Carolina's Medical Center. My wife didn't know a thing. As a, the David showed up to get Susan, they got in the truck, no car seat. My child's about six months old. And they drove, and she said, the only thing I knew to do was hold our baby girl and pray the whole way down to the hospital. Please, God, let my husband be alive. Let her daddy be alive. Please, God. And I honestly believe that Proverbs 31 woman's prayer was answered that day. Of course, when she got down to the hospital, I was up in a CAT scanner, and she ran up to see me, and she said, Tim, it was the most devastating sight I wasn't expecting. As your body was wheeling out, 
I saw where your legs were, the oxygen tank, the med packs, the chest tube stuff. And I got up, you were intubated. I had the tube down in my lungs. And the doctors looked at me and said, give him, do whatever you need to. Give him a kiss or whatever. We got to get him to surgery. And I went in for one of my surgeries out of, I think, 13 or 14, my wife would have to tell you. And I was in this coma for eight days. And during this eight-day time period, I had the most amazing journey a man will ever take in his life. My dad died in 1990. I was the EMT that actually took care of my dad for the final time. I got to see my dad sitting on a beautiful marble bench. Great-grandmother that died when I was young, but I knew who she was. Clouds all around him. I was walking. I had my legs. I got to see mountains, mountains like you've never seen on the face of this earth. Grass, the grass was so green, you didn't need any sunlight. It, just, it was so beautiful. Water that was so blue, but yet it was crystal clear. And I'll never forget, I was walking, my body was whole, and I was walking with Christ. Jesus was the one showing me all these great things. And the one thing I have to take to my grave was my body, just like our, our word, the word of God says, was whole. But Jesus Christ still bared the scars, the scars that I put on him, those very ones. And he accepted me as a child. And I'll never forget that. And he let go of my hand and said it was time to go. And I went through many different transitions. And one of the transitions I went through is I was able to see my wife sitting in the waiting room. I was trying to get to her, but it was like a force field, to, and I couldn't. It was stopping me. I just wanted to tell Susan I was okay. And in a snap of a finger, I walked through these double doors, and I was awake, and my beautiful bride was standing over me. Now, Susan wasn't there whenever I lost my legs. She didn't, they told her I lost my legs, but she wasn't with me. I was walking, and when I woke up, I looked at her, and I was ready to get out of bed. First thing I said was, give me a cup of coffee. Let's go. I was fighting the nursing staff, fighting the doctor staff. My wife got upset. She went out to the waiting area or to the nurse's station, and she was talking to him, and she said, you told me Tim knew he lost his legs. What happened? What's going on? And finally, Susan came back into the room, and I looked at her and said, they're gone, aren't they, honey? And she said, yes, Tim, your legs are gone. And to this day, as I stand before you, I have never one time questioned why did this happen to me. I looked at my beautiful wife, said, sweetie, what do we do now? I was in EMS since I was 16 years old. That's all I knew. What do I do now? Neither one of us had the answers. I remember taking a vow to myself, and I wanted to walk, and I wanted to do it in three months. In three months, I took my first steps with my nine-month-old baby girl. It was hard. My left leg, all of the muscle has turned to bone, and I'm using a lot of my hip flexor muscles just to walk. Of course, they took my right leg off above the knee. I had bone spurs. I had to go back in for more surgeries, and I didn't quit. I would look at him and say, man, this is hard, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I finally met a gentleman. His name was Kevin Carroll. Kevin was the vice president or is the vice president of Hanger Prosthetics, and he flew up from Florida. And he set me down. He said, Tim, this is what's going to happen. You're going to hurt. We, you will never have another surgery as long as I'm your prosthetist. And he explained it. You're going to hurt. Give me eight weeks. We'll get through this. And I started walking again, and I started off short. They called them stubbies. And everywhere I went, I was short. Pumping the gas, Bass Pro, wherever, I was short. Then I had the privilege of walking or going to Oklahoma City and learning to walk with my knees with a guy by the name of Randy Richardson. Randy was their audio-video technician who took a special interest in bilateral above-the-knee amputees. The day I met Randy, I literally just took off my legs and he pulled into the hotel and I went downstairs. It was 9 o'clock at night. He started talking to me and said, Tim, where are your legs? I said, well, they're up in the room. He told my wife to go get him, and he looked at me and said, Tim, what are your goals? I said, Randy, I want to walk 100% independent, and I'd like to race a car one day, too. 
He said, not a problem, Tim. We went over to the office. It was about 9.30, quarter till 10. He made me put my legs on. He took my wheelchair away. He said, Tim, if you're going to walk, you're going to do it. I said, okay. And I took a Bible verse with me, and it was Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, that verse says you can do all things through Christ. And I put that Bible verse on my heart. I was there for about seven days, and at the end of the seven days, he took me to an abandoned airstrip. And I drove for the first time with my legs since losing my legs on that January day. I left Randy, came back home. My wife and I had the privilege of flying to Italy. I walked around Italy. I left my chair here back at the States. I took two canes with me over to Italy. Every night I would go back to my hotel, have blisters on my legs, and try to do as much as I could to save them, put them back on the next morning, spent 10 days in Italy, and came back home. I finally put one cane away, walked around with one cane for a while, then one day I said, you know what, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And I put that cane away as well. And today I've had the privilege of flying all around. I've been to Haiti, I've been to Europe, I've been to Canada. I don't take a cane, I don't take a wheelchair. I do travel with somebody, usually a family member. I modeled that after Billy Graham because I don't want anybody destroying the testimony of God. And to this day, I've never questioned why did this happen to me. We're living in a battle. We have major battles going on. We have personal battles, and we have worldly battles. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. That's how we're going to make it through these battles. You have to pick up this book. It's called the Holy Bible, and you have to get into his word, and you have to start trusting in God. That's what his word says. And once you develop that trust in God, then you come back and you start learning how to fight the battle. Do you know he's got a battle plan in here for you? It's in Ephesians 6. Putting on the whole armor of God. So who do we fight against? We're fighting against the devil. When we walk out of these doors every day, we're fighting against the devil. Christianity is not outside anymore. You're not even seeing Christianity much in the church anymore. It's become a social network. We have forgotten to pick up the word of God. We have forgotten to trust the very one who created us. But to trust in the very one who created us, we have to accept his will for our lives. We can't go on our will. If we try our will and try it again and try it again, we're going to fail every time. But if we accept his will, God's will, we will succeed 100% of the time. 100% of the time, you're going to succeed with God's will. Are there going to be bumps in the road? Yes. Somebody might lose their legs over it. But it's still the will of God. What does James chapter 1 say? Consider it great joy. Can you imagine that? The doctor telling you, you got cancer. You got six months to live. And we're supposed to consider it great joy? Can you imagine the little girl that you just heard the testimony of? A little girl being raped by her own father? but yet we're supposed to consider that great joy? What joy is that with God? It's because she stood up here and gave a testimony, and she praised God, even though she went through something horrible. That's what it's like to consider great joy. And at 19 years old, she accepted him. She accepted his will. What about the gentleman who had the perfect life? The good life. But yet he found himself in college. Drinking. Now addicted to alcohol. And he's supposed to consider that great joy? 
What joy is there in addictions? I'm working with some guys right now that's addicted to pornography. What joy is that? It's destroying families. It's destroying marriages. Alcohol does the same thing. And he's supposed to consider this great joy. But what's he doing now? The will of God put him somewhere where he's helping the very ones that's addicted just like he was. That's the will of the Lord. That's why we're supposed to consider these things great joy. The band's going to come out. And they're going to start playing some music. And while they're coming out, I would like for you to bow, my, bow your heads.